director at Kachara Soup Kitchen. So aside, we have, we have spent the morning walking the talk when it comes to investment. So the question now is, can we make these changes in our daily lives and homes too? How do I become sustainable at home? And this is the question we're going to pose our panel. Would you all like to take the stage, please? All right, so first off, everybody's comfortable. <laughs> Don't worry, no, the hard questions have been asked earlier on. <laughs> so first off, Clara, I think we're going to starting off with a little snapshot of what they do, how they contribute to change. And the last part, I think, which is critical, is how you too can help. So Clara from Grace Market, please, I think you have some slides for us. Thanks, Xiaoning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Clara from Grace Market. Um, so here, we are a surplus food company that we started in 2019 and we're also a social enterprise, meaning we are a business uh, with a cause uh, as our main mission. Um, our vision is to give food and life a second chance, plus our name, Saving Grace as well. Um, yeah, so why we started this? In Malaysia, right, or even globally, there's a lot of food being wasted. And this is because um, sometimes because of imperfections. So when your fruits and vegetables, they have odd shapes or they're even like different colours or, or different bruise, sizes. Right? Yeah, bruises, scars. Uh, even if your capsicum is like dual tone. So if it's yellow but it's a bit of green, those are considered rejected upfront by the supermarkets. So to me, when I heard about that, I was a bit baffled because uh, I was working in an NGO before this and I've saw, seen how little people have to eat. So on one hand, we are like throwing a lot of food and that's one third of food that we produce. So if you have three apples, we are throwing one apple constantly. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, this cannot be you know, something that we can tolerate because a lot of people are going to bed hungry, right? especially during the pandemic. Everyone is like looking for food. So that's why we started this company, um, to give food a second chance, to give life a second chance. So we want to make food affordable and uh, accessible to everyone. Okay, so in, you can see from the slides, uh, we have rescued up to 60 tons of food. We have diverted more than 150 tons of greenhouse gases. Uh, we have fed more than 6,000 people during the last three years. We also partner with more than 45 farmers and distributors across Malaysia. And we are also supporting about 15 women entrepreneurs uh, from the low-income families. So we're providing them uh, opportunities to run businesses as well in terms of food. So how it works, very simple. This is our circular economy model. Number one, we rescue the fruits and vegetables directly from the farm. So we work with farmers. We buy um, these imperfect ones or grade B, which we call it, uh, at a discounted price from the farmers. Now, when we do this, we're helping them to reduce their losses and increasing their income. This helps with food security as well. Uh, so we, that they stay in the game, right? We don't want them to give up and say, oh, my fruits and veggies get rejected. So we help them in that sense. Uh, so we purchase and then we redirect them. So how do we do this? A, a few ways. Number one, through food aid boxes or nutrition packs. So for instance, we have been working with East Spring. They are one of our first corporate partner to give out food aid uh, uh, boxes, especially during the pandemic since 2020. Uh, we've been giving them out to more than 500 people every year. So that's a, a very good effort in, in terms of helping reduce food waste and also the farmers. So that's one way, food aid. But you as an individual, you can also buy a box, like here, a box of vegetables, a random box of veggies for only 49 ringgit. And you get um, you know, the seasonal veggies, some imperfect looking but very unique items, which sometimes you don't see in the market. Yeah, so you can buy that. And we also work with uh, F&B retailers who would like to purchase this for their own processing. So then there are obviously items that are too much, right? Then what we, we thought about it, what are we going to do? We can't sell them. Then we came up with the third part, which is repurposing them. So we started producing our own uh, sauces, our own jams using these vegetables and fruits. So we have, uh, if you visit our booth behind, you will see we have our own sambal, we have our own green curry, uh, jams as well from frozen fruits. Yeah. So that's something that we're looking into uh, to push more this year, repurposing them. And then lastly, there are items, obviously there will be parts of it you cannot use for anything else. Then we work with 
composting uh, companies to compost them and then it gets returned to the farm. So this is the model we are trying to push uh, so that it starts and ends at the same place which is on the ground and not thrown away and produce methane gases. Uh, so essentially that's what we do uh, Shawning, at Greens Market. So we're here to make sure that you know, we don't waste food and we provide a second chance to uh, uh, even people to have the opportunity to eat, uh, invest in the farmers and reduce climate change at the same time. Thank you. Okay. At this stage, I want to remind the audience that we are opening the floor to questions. So please feel free to use the Slido. Uh, and of course, if you can, please state who the question is directed at. Um, next. Suzila from Cloth Cares. I would have to confess, before I met you, I had no idea about this and it's very interesting. So please tell us about this initiative. Hello and good morning everyone. Oh, that can only mean that I have not done my work well yet. So I need to embark myself with more public speaking, right? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Suzy from Cloth. Okay. So basically, Grace Market is about food waste, right? Managing food waste and giving it a new life. And I want you to know that food waste is the number one in our landfills. Where else? Mine is basically plastics and fabrics. And this is a fact I want everyone to know. In our landfill, there's about 27% of plastics, yeah? Where else? Your textiles is only about 4%. You know, the, um, it will fluctuate over here, right? So... My name is Suzy again, and I am a co-founder of a social enterprise called Cloth. So we were incorporated 11, 12, 13, it's almost 10 years now. And what we do is to keep fabric out of landfills and keep plastic bottles out of landfills and the ocean. So why is it that plastic and fabric is because you're wearing great um, top today and I can tell you that yours is polyester. And I want you to know that usually polyester or mixed with cotton is that Are it's you? made from PET. Right? This PET bottle doesn't need ironing, you see, but never mind. Yes. <laughs> By the way, mine as well. <laughs> Why? is because, you know what? Like your polyesters, right? So that's what we do, right? Your PET bottle, the body, this one, if you recycle that, it can be made into recycled yarns. Around the world, in the first world country, most of the, your products are made from recycled yarns. So my job is to tell Malaysia, it's like, A, can you please recycle your plastic bottle and go back to the stream of formal recycling accredited and licensed? B is that after that, my job is to source fabrics. Unfortunately, the value chain is not in Malaysia, and to end from plastic to fabric. But we saw from China or India and get corporates to buy. So we have Brusa Malaysia, we have many. Eco World used to be with us as well, and many others, right? C is that. We work with IKEA, example, is one of the biggest supporter whereby, you know, unwanted curtains, their names, whatever not, right? We sew it and become our cycle products. At the end of the chain, what happens is that we put fabric bins and ask you to recycle. So it's a whole circular economy and look at we're a social enterprise. So you look at that, basically. Um, I become a full-time boy garbage collector 2018. <laughs> a different level. A different, a different level, level. To, yeah. So we collected about 4.2 million kilograms now. Um, we collected about 15,000 plastic bottles um, from the schools. More than 200,000 plastic bottles turned into fabrics and sold. And more than now, 40 Majilas women sewing for us. Mm. So I don't want to talk much, it's because my job is to get you to find these bins and recycle, donate. Um, not donate, recycle, right? Only your unwanted stuff. And we are at AT, Shell Station, Brusa, Malaysia, IKEA, One Utama, and a lot of others. Visit clawcircularity.com or Claw social media. So these are the products, right? So we saw for Shell before and a lot of other corporates as well. Because like I said, why does it matter is because your plastic bottle, like a lot of campaigns about plastic bottles, but you don't really know what people do with it, right? So yes. that's my job. Is that first world countries that, you know, plastic bottle, which is of pristine quality, you make it the plastic bottle again. Just like Spritzer now. B is that, of course, it's made into recycled yarns, right? Like, a lot of, like, example, Adidas doing it, right? In collaboration with Parley, whatever not. So, but these are all at global level. But we, at Malaysian level, when you recycle, remember this. People need this. This is value, yeah? Per metric ton, this is a lot of money. Thousands of ringgit. This is value. So, yeah. So, please visit our website. Please recycle and take recycling very seriously because you know why? 
this takes 200 years to biodegrade, decompose. Then I just pointed out, I'm wearing polyester, she's wearing polyester. I'm pretty sure yours is 100% polyester as well, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything that your denim, you can stretch, those are polyester plus cotton, 200 years in the landfills, and how it affects us is because during the biodegradation or um, what happens is that during the biodegradation, we will emit the uh, uh, type of gas called methane gases, and it's about 8 to 10% from overall ozone gases. Of course, number one is from your combustion of your car. Yeah. So this is serious, guys. So thank you very much. Okay. Last but not least, Justin Chia, Marketing Director of Kachara Soup Kitchen. Please, tell us what you do. What good work do you all do? Thank you, Shining. Uh, what are the chances you get grilled in an event? <laughs> Soon, <laughs> that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, good day to every one of you, um, my panel fellow uh, speakers. I would like to introduce you to what we do here in Kachara Soup Kitchen. Um, what we have been up to is, uh, since 2008, we've been on the streets helping the homeless people and the needy, urban poor. Yeah, There is this community of hidden poor that many would not know about, that the elderly who stays alone without much support, they rent partition rooms, just like what you see in Hong Kong and other states. Yeah, so. Um, we started off as that, um, giving free food to them, registering them, understanding them more. And then as we go along, we found out that the root cause of this problem, basically homelessness, is derived from uh, what we call that poverty, where they do not get the basic upbringing that they should be allowed to and deserve that would make them end up like what they are now or in that kind of a situation that they're in. Nobody would like to be on the streets living like, you know, no man's, uh, not a, a basic human being kind of a lifestyle. But most often what we see from the public's uh, uh, opinion is that they are lazy, you know, they do not want to do this, they might want, they do not want to help themselves. But what I am saying here from the 15 years that we have been on the streets, we found out that there are people like that. Yes, we don't deny that. But what has caught them into this situation in the first place? So that's what we really want to to highlight this event where uh, we created this food bank event where we, we feel that if we are able to tap into families like this, running a high risk of breeding homelessness, soup kitchen do not breed homeless. Soup kitchen is there because homelessness and urban poor is there. We are helping the situation. We are helping to improve them. I will explain more further. And then we are trying to see how are we going to empower them in the, uh, you know, in the process so that they can be a benefit to the society instead of keeping into uh, their lifestyle in this current uh, situation. So we are already, uh, since 2008, we achieved our tax exemption since 2013. And then we are all over Malaysia, except a little bit, we need to grow more on the East Malaysia part. Um, and the reason being is because we want to fight for a cause where we feel we can help eradicate poverty. We can help by reducing food wastage. We can help the environment better because there will be less sir, methane being emitted into the air. And we want to see in the future where we will see lesser and lesser people who are going to be more vulnerable to homelessness. That's what we want to do. We have an app, we have a database, register them, knowing them, that their, their, their situation's better. We introduce them jobs, we get them off the streets, we get them into shelters, reunite them back with their families, helping our beloved government with their work. Yeah? Basically, that's the summary. And this is what we do on the streets. And we have all these cases since 2008 itself. And then we are also providing medical. Yeah? We have volunteers. We need volunteers, doctors to come forward and help us because without the doctor, the medic team would not be able to run. Why do we need a medic team? Because most of them are subjected to skin diseases. They have liver problems. They have multi, uh, very complicated cases. You know, some even scabies. 
Yeah. So that's why we need doctors. And then here, this one is uh, the food bank where we already benefited uh, for 422 NGO charity partner home around in Malaysia. And then rescuing, the number is fake. Yeah? It's now 3 million, it's not 2 million. I uh, didn't manage to uh, update that. And then we are already benefiting 160 over 1,000 of individuals now as of what we are seeing now. And then we are all across Malaysia. And what we want to do is like this, we want to see how are we you know, help them to get a better living away from poverty, save them away from the situation, let them join among us in the society to be a beneficial part for the community. And who knows, we know when they are out from their situation, they would want to give back to the society themselves. So this is what we do and uh, feel free to go to our website and our social medias to know more about us. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for all these presentations. So I want to remind the audience once again, we are opening the floor to questions. Please feel free to use Slido. Uh, and of course, if you can state who the question is for. now. I had a look at the slides before this, of course, and what was interesting to me was all of your provided objective measurement of outcomes, right? Is this key towards running what is an ethical social enterprise, right? Because there is some measure of accountability, right? So Clara, perhaps you want to take this question. How do you measure this and does it provide us some comfort that, hey, if I'm participating, I know that there's a good outcome? Um, yeah, so for us, our main mat matrix is the amount of food that we rescue and also how much uh, money we give back to the farmers and lastly would be how many of the beneficiaries we are um, giving out the food to. So how do we calculate them? It's like every uh, vegetables that come in, we will keep a tracker of, of the weight and then we will, uh, as we give it out, we will cal calculate them as rescued. And because we are doing the entire circular chain, so even though if they are being composted, they are still considered being rescued because it goes back as a compost rather than to the landfill. Um, secondly, because we look at greenhouse gases as well because of carbon emissions, so we convert the amount that we rescue into GHG gases. So it's about 2.5 times per kilo. Lah. So you yeah. stand by what you do? Then there is we some have to, yes, we have to. Otherwise, I cannot go to bed <laughs> at night. <laughs> Conscience, very Conscience, important. Very important, yeah. Susila, also for you, I mean, you have wages to pay, you have expenses when it comes to running cloth cares, right? What's the balance between giving back to society and also having enough funds to, to run what is actually a, a business in a way? That's right. Um, okay, so there's a clear demarcation between a social enterprise and an NGO, right? Whereby a social enterprise, you can make profit, but 50% of what you earn needs to plough it back to your causes, such as I give you an example. So I'm a garbage collector for fabrics, right? So if I get money from my sponsors or the buyback money that I get from my off-takers, it should be spent on mobilizing the beans at the publicly accessible places, wrapping the beans so that it is attractive enough for people to spot that. Most importantly as well, even if there's a bean, but you don't know where it is. So it's awareness. And awareness is manpower, is the um, spending money on social media, your creatives, your, you know how to make your posters look attractive enough. So all this stuff. And most importantly, we are also sewing for the, with the marginalized communities, right? We have about 40 now. So the revenues that we get from selling the products are distributed to the marginalized community. So how do we maintain? That's a very good question, right? So we have to keep selling products. So our revenue stream are diversified. Sponsorship from the, from the sponsors, selling products, and most importantly in our world, you might have heard that trash is cash and trash is king or trash is value. I am that person in the sense that my income, my major income for cloth, 60% in 2022 are coming from buybacks from the garbage, you see? Mm. So yeah, so that's how we pay our salaries. There's seven of us, including me, who are working day in, day, day out. And we are all graduates, by the way. Yes, you all, all of us graduate. gave up corporate careers, right? Yes, corporate careers, 14 years in audit and also media. And all class team members, all women, all seven of them are bachelor degree holders. Okay. So at least there's some accountability and, yeah, you know, run professionally. I think that's important, right? So, Kachara, you feed 
or you've fed one point, you've given 1.3 million meals served to 15,000 homeless. And it's a day in, day out job. So I'm curious, how do you manage it? Is it really run like a business? How do you manage the expenses, the mob you know, mobilization, all of your volunteers? How much of that goes, of, in terms of like the, the money you collect goes into that versus really feeding the homeless or at least you know, creating that food bank? Yeah, you, in order to run it efficiently, you need manpower. And I can't thank my volunteers enough for doing, being a part of this program. But having said that, you need dedicated people just to organize events, activities. And um, what you have pointed out just now, 1.3 million meals, right? And also, I would like to remind everyone, we also rescued 3 million tons of uh, surplus food from the hypermarkets and whatnot. And that itself, we need lorries, we need workers, we need people who can organize things on the ground to, to help that 147,000 people that you've seen just now. So, um, all this will require resources. And where do we get the funding from? A lot of people would imagine that, oh, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm, my donation is just solely for the poor. You know, so in my heart, what happens to the the my people behind? You know, the who's going to pay for the fuel? Who's going to pay for their pay? You know, we need people to mobilize. Unless you're talking about a very very v efficiently run NGO, you still need people to man it behind. And I, I can attest to it because I'm the first employee of them. Now we have 23 employees. I have 23 colleagues with me now running the whole show. Um, without the support, without us having to invest into our own uh, staff, how are we going to be able to grow? And why do we need growth? We need to grow because we want to serve more people. Otherwise, we'll just be happy feeding 700 people every week and then we'll just be a cheerleader to it. And job it, done. And it's it's job never done. done. Right, it's yeah. never done. The more we see it, like just what I've said just now, uh, we started off as a question, why do we need a food bank? Because we found the root cause of homelessness is poverty. So we want to help more people from the poor sector, the urban poor, so that there will be lesser people getting a chance to become homeless in the future. So that's why we grow. And uh, we are seeing here, we will grow even more because there's a special need now, even with the current econ economic climate. We need to have more people out there to salvage more food for those who are in need and help them to be empowered to gain extra income for themselves. Otherwise, the ecosystem will just be even more serious, more dire. Then you need more NGOs coming out and go and do it. So it's, it's, it's a chicken and egg situation. Yeah, We don't have products to sell. Probably compassion if you want to. You know, so it's 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 not right for me to say that. But where are we going to get the income from? And we have to be sustainable. So that's yes. why, you know, sometimes we we might be thought like we are running a social enterprise. But actually, when we started it, it wasn't the case at all. We want it to be run professionally so that we can also inspire people who are professionals to come in to help us grow bigger. Just like what. Uh, Susie and Clara so is doing now. So it almost becomes a career, right? Yes. And then there's commitment rather than just I give you my extra time which may not be enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, otherwise, uh, for me, I've been working in the bank for like 12 years. Then I left to further my so-called career. I started my business about seven, eight years and then I bumped into KSK. And then I... I like it after volunteering about a year. I became their first employee. Now I realize I'm in another bank. <laughs> the food bank. <laughs> yeah. But this one, it doesn't carry out very strict credit checks. <laughs> it's just very yeah. happy to give it out, right? You need food, I can give you, yeah, no money. Yeah. You don't need to fill in any complicated forms or right. provide any... You know, like income tax, nothing. You can just come and get it. Well, having said that, we do very uh, stringent uh, checks on our recipients so that we are accountable yes. to the sponsors that we have given this packet of food to this specific person who needs it more than the other person. Okay, the next question I have is the importance of these uh, public-private partnerships in a way, or corporate partnerships. And I see that in your websites. So clearly, how can Malaysia Inc. contribute more? So Clara, we'll start with you. Do you, do you. Is it easy to get corporate sponsorships? Are they very reluctant to do good work with you? 
Uh, I think in the beginning, it uh, depends really on the appetite of the company, right? So in the beginning for us, we started off as very uh, B2C kind of a, a market. But as the pandemic came, we, we shifted into a lot more food aid and nutrition programs. And that's where we worked with a lot of corporates, starting with East Spring, of course. I think that really pushed us to look towards that. Because um, East, Spring, East Spring really believed in not only helping the poor, but also helping the farmers. So we created this partnership together since 2020. I think that paved the way for, for the rest of other partnerships with corporates or even with foundations. Um, it's not easy per se because food, rescuing food is still something that it's new or or even helping social enterprise in a sense, is still hard to penetrate for us to the corporates because a lot of times they want tax exemption, which we do not have at the moment. So we still have to pitch and really go for those who really believe in our mission in that sense. Uh, but it's definitely very important for us to create these partnerships uh, so that we can continue to stay in the game. Okay, and for you, Susila, was it hard to put your foot through the door? And, you know, over the last few years, we had pandemic and some companies, of course, struggling themselves. So is it harder now or easier? That's a very good question. So CLOTH was incorporated in 2013. From 2013 until 2015, it was, a, it was a very painful uphill battle, you see. Why? It's because United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, SDG... 17 of them. 17 of them was launched in 2015. So we started the company two, two years before. So I can tell you that since 2015, it was easy. It's because when there's commitment by more than 190 countries around the world, and Malaysia is one of it, I promise you, it's almost like super easy because people come to us, the corporates. Example, the first one who came to us was Gas Jeans because they needed to recycle their denims as part of your global campaign. We partner, one of our first was Bursa Malaysia itself. Why? It's because of GRI. So they walk the talk, say they adopt a fabric bin right next to Bursa Malaysia Bukit Kewangan. We have Sunway who are installing the bins throughout the Sunway malls, the theme parks and a lot of others as well. So yes, if you can't see it because you know because it's not your industry. Me representing a lot of corporates, a lot of enterprise and private entities, they are doing a great job. And I want you to know something that Claus is a registered company, three countries: Australia, Malaysia, and Singapore. I'm Malaysian, but we are very active in Malaysia and Singapore. I've been in and out from Singapore. I want you to know that if you're a Malaysian, is something you should be proud of. Is because we are way ahead. Yes, okay, that's that a fact. Yes, thank we're you. We're not usually way ahead for a lot of things. I can speak on behalf, that's a fact. <laughs> that is good news. What about you, for you all at Kachara? I mean, is there a strong relationship with corporate Malaysia in terms of what people you know, offer for services? Or is it like commitment, monthly commitment? Because you feed so many people every month, right? So you need X dollar. I'm sure that, you know, sometimes you have a headache. How, do I, how am I going to get the funds? Is there that level of commitment from Malaysian corporates? Well, they come in and chip in as they can. Yeah, uh, I must say there are a few who are really continuing supporting us all these years, uh, but most of them are actually donations in kind. What uh, boils me down to the uh, uh, year end is how much are we getting to cover our operations mm -hmm. expenses? Um, most of the people are more inclined into donations in kind, which is a little bit helpful. It's helpful, but not enough for us. So okay. in the end of the day, we need to be seen in the public. We need always advertise, uh, uh, advertisement. Uh, we need to promote ourselves more. And there's a danger to it so because the people are saying that we are commercialized. But then people don't see what's happening on behind. We have 23 mouths to feed for, for sure every month. Mm -hmm. And we have a few trucks to fill up the fuel so that we can carry on with our work. And that itself, if they don't break down. And we have places to keep food. Where are we going to store those? And who is kind enough to offer us a place? In fact, we are looking for a building just to consolidate everything in KL. So how, how to do it is like we, we have to sell it to the corporates that they're, when they're more willing to help. Yes, they have allocated a certain budget every year. It's really depending on what sort of pillar programs they are more uh, supportive to. So in, in this sense, we are able to help them with the uh, to so-called hold an event for them. 
at the same time, they, they get to have like a team building uh, kind of a feel for their employees to come and join. So uh, in, in that fact, I am very glad that uh, we have been receiving inquiries and even participation from the corporates. And this is, I, I must congratulate everyone. And I, I would probably want to say more like, you know, I, I want to make a plea to the public where uh, corporates play an important role in every NGO society because at least from our point of view, 60% of our donations are from the corporates and foundations. Okay. I've got a question from the audience who wants to know, and I'm also curious to know, um, does Kachara get any, any assistance from the government? I mean, is there any cooperation with government? Because homelessness is really a KL issue. I mean, I'm sure it happens in rural areas, but I, I, I used to do running in the morning in, in the centre of town, and the homelessness, the issue, the problem is growing for sure. Yeah. Um, my answer is no, because um, we are thought to be on our own, to find your own resources to benefit the people. So in the end of the day, you're looking at a situation where we have to be independent. Mm. Uh, what the government can help is already uh, by them endorsing on our work, which means the tax exemption. Um, in that way, they feel, yes, this, this is encouraging and we want to help you with your work. And since you are helping every uh, races, you know, without any political, uh, discriminating their political background or even their gender. So we're helping you and you're transparent, your account is good. So we want to legitimize your work mm. and support you in that way. But uh, money-wise, yeah, government, uh, sorry, we don't have any resources for you. Okay. Uh, I have a question and this is really going back to us as individuals, right? In terms of what we can do in our homes or our, in terms of the decisions we make, how we spend our money. Uh, and I'll start with you, Clara. You know, really, if I wanted to to participate in the good work of your your company, what, what can how can I contribute? Is it always just down to, to money? Um, okay, so I, th I think before even starting with us, right, we need to go back to our own habits. Firstly, I would say maybe even just start with your own at home, like start thinking about what you put on your plate and then, you know, how can you finish it? I think that's already uh, a step. And then secondly, you can obviously support uh, businesses like us or even NGOs, um, either monetarily or even just by following our pages and, you know, keeping up with what we do and then, you know, hopefully you can share it with others as well. Um, but in terms of whether it's always money, I think money is a driver to achieving our, you know, what we want to achieve. It does help because um, if we have the passion, for us, we have the passion to do it. But if we do not have the funds, we don't have the money, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, but if you have money without any passion, it's also not going to bring us anywhere. So I would say money does play in, uh, something like that definitely helps in what we do. Um, you can always support us either donating so that we can sponsor families or you yourself can purchase your own and uh, purchase our own products and enjoy it for yourself. So um, as a corporate, we also do gift packs. Uh, we work with corporates to do gift packs. We also can be your uh, fruit supplier for your, you know, your own company's uh, HR benefits. So those are ways we can explore uh, because purchasing from us helps, us helps in many ways compared to just a regular supplier. Okay, and for you, Susila, how can people help cloth cares? Good question. So, as a social enterprise, we lot like we are in a circular economy, right? If circular economy, there's demand, there's supply, so there should be money as well, or else, you know, that's not economy, right? However, I would like to break it down into certain parts, especially you guys today, right? As a community, as a Malaysian, you live in Malaysia, right? Um, I don't need your money to recycle, but what I need is your time and discipline, right? And in fact, your textile and waste clothing is the easiest that you can contribute because you can do your cleanup or your decluttering maybe one week, two weeks before Chinese New Year or before Christmas for that matter. And all you need to do is to get your act together, your family members to like, which one that you don't want? You put away, right? Come on, don't keep the, you know, those stuff because a lot, we dub service like hundreds of thousands of people, right? You Guilty. put away. <laughs> I put away along the way. I'm in my 40s now, right? I can't wear something in my 20s anymore, if not even the style, right? So you have to have an appointment with your family and identify it might be cloth cast bean, from our website, you can check out our Instagram or any accredited and 
licensed rec recyclers. I always mention that is because you know why? You should support licensed people because or else they will take your garments and after that you will take the good clothing and then the rest of it they will put it in the landfill. So now answer number one for your recycling, I don't need your money, I just need your old clothes. But for upcycling products, yes, we encourage you if you are a decision maker for your company you are the chief marketing officer or chief sustainability officer or ceo please have this consideration buy some of your products upcycle products from the locals right if you lot yourself you're in tourism like you support like, um, sustainable tourism like the baseline of it is you need to buy from known sources right so and lastly is that if your corporate corporation has a lot, uh, not a lot, I mean, that's okay, it's wrong, sorry, boss. Um, you have funds, example, please. A little bit extra. Uh, extra, that's right, yeah. Garbage collectors on it. Sometimes our jagger's not right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for that. So if you have like the right, you know, um, budget, right? Please opt for sustainable fibers. It's because there's no point that you're recycling, but there's no demand to recycle polyester fabrics. Yeah, there's no demand to recycle bottles. It's like in the end, it goes back to the landfill. So my answer is both. But most importantly, the smallest that you can do, please do a family decluttering session and look for your closest fabric bin. Thank you. Okay, that one's you know I think everyone can start doing that. It's not it's not a difficult ask. What about for you, Air Kachara? What do you need most? Is it volunteers? Is it sponsorship? Because it's not easy feeding so many people on the street, right? Yes, uh, we definitely need all the help we can get. Um, preferably cash, because why? With cash, we can buy something that we would not normally get, especially cooking oil these days. Uh, we also run the food bank program. We need provisions. We need uh, rice, we need uh, biscuits, we need some instant noodles, something that you can keep for them to ration it over the month. We give the people that I've shown just now on a monthly basis. There's about 3,000 over families, I'm not mistaken by now, that we are giving on a constant monthly basis. And uh, one of the most difficult item or commodity we can get is cooking oil because each person can only limit to two bottles i would less i was led to believe because it's supposed to be a control item yes it is right so it's very hard for us to get that and when even when we buy the price is sky high these days so it's it's it kind of like eaten up onto our resources so mm -hmm. That is why I'm uh, making a plea out to ask from the public to drop off food at our food bank, wherever you are. If you have any family members who are staying in up north in Penang, in uh, Ipoh, or down south in Malacca, the Greece of Milan, or Johor, please feel free to contact us uh, to drop off donations to us directly. Yeah. yeah, so can they find out this information on your website where yes. the drop off points are? Same with you, Susie? Yes. Yeah. So, yes. okay. Um, you know, this. This part when you all are asking for donations is really cute because we've got a, a, somebody in the hall who is offering seven, 72 cartons of fresh milk. <laughs> okay, uh, oh, expiry end nice. of the month. They want to know whether you want to make use of them, uh, but they need cool storage. So I don't know who you are. Please come and see. <laughs> Maybe not Susila because she she's not going to you're not going to do much with the milk. But the two of them, Clara and um, not for your polyester, Justin. Yeah. Please. Go and see them after this, you know, we would like to really, of course, put this milk to, to good use. I think that's important. Um, you know, we've got an interesting question here, and I think it's, you know, it's for Justin, but I want to ask both of y'all. And that is, you know, in the time that you've run these organisations, what has been the most difficult challenge that you encountered? Was it during the pandemic? Uh, you know, did you suddenly see a lot more homeless people and not much donations? W what was it? Clara, do you want to start? What was the most challenging part? To inspire us, you know, that, you know, this road is something that... It's not easy, but it, we, we need to persevere so that ESG is really part of our daily lives and in, in how you make that difference. Okay, um, maybe more on a personal note, uh, because I was from uh, NGO background and then I started this company as an entrepreneur three years ago. So for me, it's a very big difference because from receiving, now I have to keep asking and selling things, which is, I'm not really good at selling. <laughs> so uh, I think that was a very challenging period. Being an entrepreneur is very challenging. Starting a business is very challenging. But to make it sustainable while still trying to 
you know, hit a mission, uh, that's even even extra challenging. So to me, every during the first year, uh, I always question myself, like, am I doing the right thing? Like, you know, how long do I want to do this? Because uh, it's taking a toll on like, you know, my mental health and physically, you know, you have to work day in, day out, like all the time, there's no, there's no break. Because when in the beginning, especially when you're bootstrapping, you're doing everything on your own, right? From packing the veggies, carrying the veggies, imagine my small <laughs> you know, body have to carry like 20, 40 kilos kind of uh, vegetables, packing them, delivering them uh, together with my partner. You know, we have to do this all our own because we didn't want to spend too much, right? Um, and then, then going home to do your social media and <laughs> look at your finances, paying suppliers. So everything you have to do on your own. I'm sure you can yeah, identify with that. So that was a very difficult period. But as we continue to try to stabilize, I think that helped uh, a lot. And then through partnerships, that also helped. Um, but in terms of business-wise, the challenge would be to educate our clients on surplus food because it is not common yet in Malaysia. And if you go to other countries like Australia, you go to France, Denmark, US, UK, surplus food is like a very known thing. Even people buy surplus food all the time. Mm. And surplus meaning imperfect looking or food in excess, right? Still edible, it's just that maybe they don't look as per your usual. In fact, just a f fact, your vegetables mem memang don't look Normal one. <laughs> Just if it looks exactly the same, that's not normal because it's it's been Imp imperfect, just like us. Yeah, it's just, we are all unique, right? So same as our fruits. Like, do you think all your cucumber look the same and has the same height and the same length, or even your tomato have the same size? No, it has all been filtered out because of society standards. So um, educating our, our, or bring the awareness to our clients, that's the main thing. Lah, because when we have our physical shop at that time, you know, we will have aunties coming to us. Aunties, <laughs> sorry. But they're like, why your veggies look like this? Uh, why not fresh one? You know? Or look, um, got this kind of shape and the kind of thing. So we have to sp spend a lot of time educating. And especially during pandemic, because we were one of the first few to start um, delivering veggie boxes out. So we have no time to educate our client that it will look weird. Right? So a lot of time they come back to us, hey, your veggie look weird. Ah. So we have to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them. Perfectly yeah. edible <laughs> and nutritionally still the same, yes. right? Yeah. In fact, maybe more natural. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. What about you, Susila? Your, your most challenging period, you know? Uh, my challenging period is that during COVID-19, in which, again, I blame myself and our industry people, is that, you know, like, Waste management is part of the essential service. Did you know that paper recycling factory was still operating during throughout MCO because waste management? However, fabric recycling, plastic recycling factories did not get any permits from the government to operate. So, if... Your bins, nobody was collecting anything. No, we can't. We have to close it. It's because, again, awareness is like, okay... In terms of industrial level, right, which is, like I said, it should be our role as industry players whereby I should be educating the government and the METI, whatever, not that paper is just one part of recycling. We are just, in fact, plastics is worse, it's 200 years, textile are worse 200 years, so it was extremely bad for us. If the factory is closed, I can't eat, right? Mm. Yep, so that's the truth. So in terms of educating, I take the blame, I own it, my industry people own it, we need to tell the government, we are just like Alam Flora. In fact, we saved that from going to the landfills. And by the way, I want you to know that this is my job, by the way. By the way yeah? If you throw something into your garbage bin, it goes into the landfills, that's not free. Yeah? It's government spending, right? Our government is spending about 2 billion ringgit a year and paying to our concessionaires here in Alam Flora, whatever not. Yeah? So, and then going to the landfills per metric ton or 1,000 kilogram, the price about 50 to 70 ringgit. That's not inclusive of your methane gases and all the environmental degradation as well, yeah? Thank you. Okay. So, think twice before you throw something away, right? Think about whether it can be reused, recycled. Um, Justin, finally, what was the toughest challenge you faced in, what, 15 years at yes. Kuchara? Yes, it is. Um, in fact, from 2008, the toughest challenge is always to maintain the books to be in the green always. and oh, to be like able any to other business almost. If it not it is actually, you know, Shoning, um I mean, I hate to say this, but uh, from the NGOs that we are running, we are actually 
it's more difficult to run compared to a business. At least you have a product to sell. For us, we don't have, and the work is extra long. I agree with uh, what Clara said. I echo. Uh, we we work on Sundays. We work in the nights. Nobody saw that. You see, uh, but. It's very difficult to hire people as well. You have to have to offer this kind of a market rate in order to get the right people to come in. And we need to be even more efficient. And to balance book is always been our agenda. You know, towards the year end, we want to do a planning. Mm -hmm. We have always wanted to have a, 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 what you call that, a soft landing or a, a two year budget plan in advance, meaning your NGO must be able to survive without any donations coming in in the event for at least two years. Wow, well, visibility is important. Too, yes, right? and, and this is important because it allows us to execute what we want to do in the next term. So like this year, we are going into, the, uh, into educating the Orang Asli children. If we do not have the funds, how are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. And we can't plan. We can't do it like, oh, let's do it now, you know. We must need a proper plan because we need to be efficient. And all this has to come into the picture. And you know what? The toughest challenge is when in during MCO, where we, like everyone else, are not able to move around. Although we are providing essential service, and let alone the homeless people on the streets. And there are some families who are crying because they don't have income, and many of them are daily wage earners. How do? How are they going to get food? You see. So we have to brave ourselves to churi churi. <laughs> And then, also to risk our lives. You know, yeah. uh, we have elderly parents. You know, we, we have people who are vulnerable too in our families. We have to risk ourselves, not knowing the how the the uh, the impact will be onto our lives, and also the volunteers will be briefing themselves. So, so we have to operate like a really very lean, without. Even this is like a taboo already. So we must be like this. this Social thing. distancing, remember right. those days. Yeah, yes. they have to queue up and we have to make sure the line is far apart, safe enough. And when the police stop by, then they say, okay, good work. Then they just go off, right? So that is very, very helpful. And, and that itself, when we want to do this, we have to make sure we, we, we told the line. And um, great, grateful to all the effort, we are able to say that now the homelessness uh, issue is uh, controllable. Compared to those days, we are giving out like 1,300 packets per week, uh, per, on the Saturday night itself, one night. Now we are talking about just 700 over, and half of them are actually meant for those who are actually uh, living in their own rooms. Okay. Partition room. So there are actually not so many homeless people physically living on the streets, but they are more on the hidden side. All right. On that note, thank you for your time today. On thank the panel you. for sustainability at home was Clara Wan, founder and CEO of Grace Market, Nick Suzila Hassan, co-founder of Cloth Cares, Justin Chia, marketing director of Kachara Soup Kitchen. And if you would like to know more about the good work they do, please do have a look at the booths at the back of the hall. Back to you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please give them a big round of applause. Um, can I just ask the ESG 